This channel does not promote or encourage any illegal activities. All contents provided by this channel is meant for educational purpose only. All right, we're ready, guys. Welcome back to the podcast. Super excited about today's guest, Peter Meyerhoff. A, uh, how old are you right now? 37. 37 year old. Lots to talk about today. I think today's all about um, overcoming obstacles, perseverance. From what I know, you had a lot going for you younger, yeah. uh, up till 18. You went to prison from 18 to 30. Yes. Um, we'll obviously go through that. Your nickname's Chappie from that, from yeah. what you told me. Yeah. And um, yeah, today I just want to talk about that story and cool. really more so how can we relate the perseverance into the, the business world. So go ahead, just introduce yourself and we'll get going. Cool, yeah. Uh, Peter Meyerhoff is my name. Uh, the nickname is Chappie and it's literally just, I got it from a chapstick addiction I got in prison. And uh, when you're a youngster in there, you don't get to say what your nickname is. So that I got that nickname labeled to me, and I've been running with it since then. Um, I got a website, PeterMyoff.com. Podcast is Roll Call with Chappie, and that's C H A P P Y. And I'm on the same mission. You know, I'm just trying to change and inspire the world to overcome things that people think they can't overcome. Yeah, cool. So, so just going back, um, where'd you grow up? What state? Um, what would that look like? I grew up in Ahwatukee, um, Arizona, and then, you know, was the I had it all as a kid, you know, like I was in a movie as a kid. I had a modeling agent. I was a top athlete and screwed all that up and ended up becoming Ahwatukee's Most Wanted before I went to prison at 18 years old. Ahwatukee's <laughs> Most Wanted. They didn't have the That's TV. They didn't, about they that. didn't have the so TV show no, out back then. Trust me, they? there's no hardcore people there. It, it wasn't <laughs> like I did. A, I got 12 years for a burglary charge, bro. Like it was wow. nothing crazy. So, yeah, let's let's just start there. Okay. Um, so you want me to tell you how my life spiraled? out of? Yeah, let's like I want to I want to go through it. And then I want to get into prison, what yep. you learned in prison. Is it like the TV shows you see? And then kind of come out and let's talk about your business today. So let's start there. How'd you get in there? Yeah, so um, I had an, uh, you know, honestly, I had a fake sexual assault at when I was 15 years old. We weren't even driving. We we're freshman high school, me and my best friend and two hot chicks in school that I've known forever. They're old. We weren't even driving, so their older brother would supply the alcohol. They'd literally sneak out of their room just like that. They did a sleepover. You know, like you do when you're kids. They come over Friday night because my mom's a flight attendant, so my house is always empty. We hook up Friday night. I lose my virginity. Do the same thing Saturday night. The, literally the exact same thing. Two on two, us four. And then Sunday, I call them, and, like, somehow she says I had sex while she was sleeping. And I'm like... What, like, what do you even mean? I don't even know what the fuck that means, you know? <laughs> How's that possible? L like, literally. I was like, I, I don't even understand that. And nobody backed me up. Like, literally. Like, my own best friend didn't say a word about yeah, it. I was going to say, he didn't. Didn't say a word about it. And I, to this day, I the only thing I can think of is that she was hammered drunk and got caught sneaking in or something. And it was the first thing that came to her mind to take some of, like, attention off her. It's the only thing that makes sense. To cover no for her own self. There's zero she reason to ever say that, you know? And um, I think that's what it was. I don't know. But also all my friends, I went from, like, being the, the dude in high school to I couldn't go to high school. Like, yeah. literally, like, I had to, like, leave. Like, I wasn't safe there, you know. And dropped out of school, started hanging out with dudes that aren't in school. And all yeah. these dudes do hard drugs. And I've never even experienced this shit or even seen these drugs. But I don't care anymore. Like, literally, I have zero to live for, you know. Like, that's how I feel like, felt like my whole life's over, you know. I was a top athlete. I didn't get to play sports in high school. Like, I, this happened before my freshman year was over. You know, so, like, wow. all my sports are gone. To this day, I've never played a high school game. Wow. Yeah. What sports were you playing when you were in middle Baseball, school? Baseball, football, uh, boxing. I ran track. I literally did anything, you know. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so that even happened before my first semester of freshman year was over. So, I, like, I only have three months of high school to this day, and, like I said, never played a high school game wow. in any sport. And then for, for, I guess, 15 to 18, it would have been, obviously, drugs became an addiction. and Absolutely. And, and selling, Absolutely. presumably. My friends sold drugs. I would just, I, you know, I was just on drugs. I would just like yeah. to go steal shit and ro like do dumb, horrible stuff, you know, stealing cars. You know, I stole a Mercedes Benz from the Mercedes Benz dealership, brand new. Wow. Um, back when gone in six and, and I, I actually want to pause you there. Why? Like, what went through your head at that moment? This is a good idea. That's all I was doing. We were doing is just stealing shit. That's like all I did. I didn't have, you know, like we would steal shit and then get locked up and then like come back out and do it again. Oh. Like, literally, like, I, like I, real I life. honestly gave up on life. I didn't care about anything. Like, no joke. I was like, I still had to, and you know what's crazy is I, I was doing that, and I still had to, like, hide in Ahwatukee. Like, it's a small little town. Like, everybody knew me there, you know what I'm saying? So, like, mm -hmm. even though I'm not in school, like, I still had to get nervous, like, going to the grocery store, like, out on Friday nights to, like, the Wendy's there where all the high school kids hung out. Like, I had a miserable 15 to 18-year year life, you know? And then um, coming full circle, my it's spring break, which should have been my senior high school. My little brother and his friends come to my mom's house because she was a flight attendant, so the house was always empty. And they come back and tell me that they just 
burglarized the Nelson's house. And the Nelson's house is my best friend that didn't fucking say shit about me. He has a little brother that's my brother's age. Mm. We've known him since we were kids. That's why I'm like, I couldn't believe he never didn't say a word. Like, I've known his family since we were five years old. Like, yeah. my mom knows his mom, like, everything. And so they told me that they did that. And I'm like, where are they at? They're like, they're in Hawaii. I'm like, shut up. Because they have the biggest house in Awatuki. Like, his dad was the CEO of um, University of Phoenix and Apollo Colleges. Yeah. His dad's a scumbag, though. If you look and read articles, like, he just he does this shady stuff to colleges and makes a ton of money and then gets thrown out on these, like, scandals and gets paid a bunch of money. Like, coming full circle, that they're a bad family. You know what I'm saying? So it is what it is. I, I feel bad about what I did, but I did it solely because I'm like, oh, shit, hell yeah. He didn't back me up. So we went back there. Stole a bunch of stuff, and I just got the book thrown at me. I was 18 years old. My co-defendant was 18. My brother and were 15 and 16, and they made it look like I was influencing these juveniles to do this. When the story didn't come out that they told me after they burglarized the yes, house. They're the like, one to call If you. I didn't do it, the house was already burglarized. And to be honest, I didn't make it out of the garage, bro. I literally stole a, a drill, a snowboard, Jordan basketball shorts, and Jordan fucking sandals, and I got 12 years in prison for it. Wow. Because my, my friends that stole the jewelry and the other people that stole everything, they all told the cops that I stole them, and I didn't say shit because I was like this. I had just been to jail for the Mercedes, so I'm like, I'm not snitching. I'm this fucking badass kid now, you know? So I didn't say anything. Everybody else says it's me. That's the story they go with. And then yeah. I had the worst judge in Arizona's history for sentencing. He had this thing in his head where kids' minds weren't fully matured until they were in their 30s. So he literally locked me up for 18 plus 12 years is 30. So that was his reasoning? Yeah. And, and he you said banned. you'll be... You'll transform, and when you're 30, you'll be a different person. He said you only have a chance. You don't have a chance until you're in your 30s. So he said, he, his theory was if he let you out at, say, 25, you would still not be matured. Yep. And you couldn't do it. Yep. Wow. And he got banned from being a judge after that because they said he was too harsh on his sentences. But they never yeah. let me out of prison. 12 I years, years for – well, obviously the car was previous, but you – No, I got you, 12 years for a non-dangerous theft went, charge. One theft of controlled property. And, I got and the value was probably under $1,000 total? What I stole was about – thousand two thousand bucks but i mean there was 10 kids that burglarized this twelve thousand square foot house over a, yeah. over a weekend so there was it ended up being three hundred and thirty thousand dollars for the shit stolen out of this wow. house and what did they like, i had and so my friend that was 18 years old too he got caught stealing their jewelry and selling it directly to pawn shops he had three more class two felonies i mean he got two and a half years because he told that's me i was me. curious because he told on me yeah oh my gosh you man. know want to know where he is where back in prison for the fifth time well who won yeah literally who won you want to know where the other kid that snitched on me whose idea it was uh, dead the cops killed him and he got out of prison for the third time oh my gosh what a story yeah so you so get I got fucked in the worst sense and these dudes are dead and still in prison i'm out here a multi-millionaire well, like changing lives yeah who won yeah so so it was all meant to be like the sentence was meant to be like i got put in maximum security and like all, all did all that suffering in there like because like for what i do now like with the prison curriculum we'll get into that at the end but like People in prison don't listen to you. Like, they won't listen to you unless you walk their footsteps. Right. On top of Can't going relate. to prison, it's even, it's even more descriptive with yards. So, like, if I'm on a four-yard and you haven't been to a four-yard and you're trying to tell me what to do but you ain't even been to a, a four-yard, I'm sorry, if I'm on a three-yard now and I've been to a four-yard and you're trying to tell me shit but I know you've never even been to a four-yard, I'm not going to listen to a fucking word you say. Same goes for four yards of maximum security. You know what I'm saying? So, I, like, I ran maximum security. Like, I ran sentry at the walls when I was 26 or something. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, the worst of the worst. I got out from the hole in Maury, which is murder Maury. Like, I was, my last 10 months, I got out, and I was under investigation for an attempt to murder from, the, like, the most gangster foyer in the state. Wow. And I had zero plans for what I was going to do when I got out. Literally no fucking plan in the world. I didn't even think I was going to get out. Yeah. Oh, I want to talk about the day you got out. But before, what, like, just bullet points, almost just for quick information, then we'll get into it. Like, what are the top three to five things that you learned in prison that you take with you today? How to hustle. How powerful our mind is. I'm claustrophobic, bro. Like, I have ADD, ADHD. Like, I spent years in a five by seven. And, like, how'd you do it? You're claustrophobic. I'm like, you just fucking do it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, you have you zero have no choice. choice. <laughs> you don't get to go out. Like, you're, you're throwing. Sir, I need a bigger Yeah, you're room. throwing in maximum security, which means you fucked up in there. Like, they give zero shits what you say. You know what I'm saying? Like, you could fucking have a panic attack in that cell, and all they're going to do is put you in a powder, like, a, uh, an even smaller room and, like, shackle you up. You know what I'm saying? Like, they, it, you, they, you don't get to say anything. Yeah. So, I didn't. And I didn't learn anything positive in there except for, like, literally how to hustle and, like, how to, like, just how strong my mind really is, you know? Because I was weak-minded when I went in there, you know? Like, I remember being in the county jail, and my mom was – I still remember this. Like, it was yesterday. She was at Applebee's, and I was fucking crying. I'm like, how the fuck are you at Applebee's and I'm in jail right now, you know? Because I couldn't fucking, like – I couldn't do time. I couldn't fathom that. Like, life went on, and I was in here. And come to think about it, I still had 12 years to go, you know what I'm saying? And yeah. it's like, you get used to it. And then you just – you know what I mean? You, 
it becomes normal. You grow up and you tell yourself, fucking, you know, you put yourself in there. It is what it is. And granted, I got a, I mean, the, I, I think I have the worst theft charge in Arizona's history, I believe, for not going to trial, you know. And uh, I was bitter as shit about that. And that's why I got into prison politics, you know, and started, like, running yards and stuff. Because um, I didn't care. And I was like, if God was real, how the hell could he give me a 12-year prison sentence, you know. And it wasn't until, like I said, thank God I went and did my last 10 months in solitary confinement and really had to look at my life, you know, and I was like, what am I doing? All right, if I make it out of this, like, I'm done. But I even thought then I couldn't make money when I got out. Like, I thought I was only still going to only be able to do construction, and I'm like, I got to figure out how to get sober, but I'm going to have a boring-ass life, but at least I'm not in prison, you know, like, and that's why I ended up quitting my job. Like, I literally didn't think it was possible to make this money, and I was like, fuck, I got to go show these dudes, like, we can do this, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And that's literally why I quit my job. Wow. So... When you were, you were saying when you were, obviously you're frustrated when you're in there, um, what point in time do you, like timely, do you say, hey, I just got to do this? Like, did it take you a year? Did it take you six months? Like, when did you mentally turn the corner? This is my life for the next 12 years. Damn. Yeah. I don't even know. I mean, like I, I remember yesterday, like I'm used to being the popular kid, you know, even in county jail, I was a kid and I ended up running pods in county jail. Like I'm an alpha male, you know, like don't mm-hmm. make the situation. I'm gonna figure it out, you know? And I remember walking the, the first night to, like, dinner at the chow line, and I'm like, holy shit, like, I am a nobody here. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, nobody even, like, recognized me. And I'm like, how the hell am I going to do this? And I remember, like, I could tell they didn't, like, think anything of me. I'm really good at reading body language and stuff, you know? Like, no one wanted to give me too much rap and conversation and stuff. And I ended up, like, picking a fight with a dude, like, solely on purpose. And because I heard about doing stuff like that, you know? And it was the dude running my building, and he was – legit twice my size it was like jason jonas against me right now like that that was the difference it was and no shout offense, out jason, no offense, jason shout jonas, out jason but. on the fly. <laughs> <laughs> but uh it's it was that di- difference you know what i'm saying and i and i beat the living shit out of this dude and i remember we go on lockdown for a day and the next day you come out to chow and all these dudes are like youngster we heard what you did and i'm like right then i was like all right all right i can figure this out at least i can fight and i can like do this because one of the hardest things about me like at first was like how am I going to go around, like, with no one even giving a fuck that I'm, like, alive? That's how, that's how I felt. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not in with these gangster killers. I'm fucking from Awatuki, bro. You know? Like, I don't, I don't fit in with them. Like, everybody in there is a gang member. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm-hmm. literally everybody in there is a full-on gang member. And I'm, like, this dude from Awatuki with long blonde hair, and I used to model and stuff. You know what I'm saying? Like, but come full circle, I end up running pretty much every yard I touch, you know? Yeah. So I don't want to sit in prison for too long. Obviously, I want to learn about it. I want to learn about it today, too. But the last question I want to ask before we get going is what was going through your head that day you got out? Other than we already mentioned, what am I going to do? But like, how did it feel going back to normal and going, holy crap, now I got to figure it out? To show you how like much I had to completely change my mindset. So I got my last my last 48 hours. Uh, I was, like I said, in solitary confinement. I didn't sleep the last two days. Like, no joke. I'm not joking. I literally sat up in this that little two-and-a-half, three-inch window thing and would just pace back and forth to myself for two days straight. And then they let me out. I remember I put my blues on, and I'm like, you are fucking kidding me. Like, I cannot believe I'm getting out of prison. Like, no, I never thought. I swear to God, bro, I, like, I never, ever, ever thought I was going to get out of there. I told my family, like, the week before my one phone call from solitary. They're like, next week, and I'm like, don't jinx it. I'm like, I don't have, like, if I get out, I'm, I'll be shocked. You know, like. And for some reason, I had such a bad feeling. My dad lives in South Dakota. I didn't even want my dad to fly down. Because I'm like, just in case, I feel like they're going to hold me in here, Dad. You know, like, because they kept doing that to me. Like, I felt like they didn't want to let me out. They kept adding months onto my time. And because I was first to only be in solitary for like three months. And then, like, you had these old tickets. So here's another 90 days. And then, like, oh, here's another one. So you have 60 more days. So I was supposed to get out, like, I want to say August of 14 or something. And then they add, like, eight more months to my sentence. I ended up missing thanksgiving christmas my birthday january and i get out february 26 right after i turned 30 years old so yeah i had zero my 20s free and i get out and i remember i'll I'll, i could show you the video after this but i'm like changing out there out of these blues because they didn't even fit me and my my dad and them had bought me some uh clothes so i'm changing the parking lot and i asked my dad i was like hey can i do this right here he's like yeah and i'm like can i change this right here he's like Pete, you can do whatever you want now. And I'm like, I literally sat there, and I, I watch this to this day, so, and I'm like, I literally could see myself. I look up in the sky, and I'm like, holy shit, I literally can now. You know, like, yeah. I've been asking permission <laughs> for 12 years, you know. And we drive out, and they give you, like, your whole packet of paperwork. And they hand my paperwork to the guy, and he literally hands it back to me, and I, like, snatch it from my dad's hands because he left a little paperclip on there. 
Like my mindset, like a paper clip's gold in solitary confinement. And like my mindset as I'm getting out of prison is I like snatch the paper out of my dad's hand and like, what the hell is that? I was like, there's a paper clip on here. Like, no joke, try to hide it like from the cop right there while my dad's talking to him, like saying bye to him. And my brother look at me and I look back and I'm like, oh fuck. Like that, that it didn't even click to me. And I was like, oh my, I'm like, well, this is gold and where I just lived half my life. You know what I mean? Yeah. But that's where my mindset was. Like, I'm sneaking paper clips out of like paperwork and stuff. And then they let me out on the streets with zero plan. No joke, not a plan in the world of what I was going to do. So you're driving out and... And I'm getting to find out this house that I've been writing letters to for, t- for years that I'm going to go live at, but I don't even know where it is and I've never seen it. So it's like, it's such right. a surreal thing. You're driving down the street and I'm like... And I remember my dad was like telling me, he's like, this is where you turn right, you know, this is your street. And then he goes right here and then this is your cul-de-sac, you know? And I'm just like, it was like I was a little kid, you know? Right. But I'm this 30-year-old fucking big shot call. I was 264 pounds, you know? Like I was huge. Okay. So... So you get to the house. Uh, I, every time I watch, I, I love watching crime-related stuff, uh-huh. and I sometimes have watched um, prison shows and different things. And one of the interesting things some of these shows show is, like, they've been in for 10 years or 20 years. What was the thing that you saw that we now had? Like, for some of them, it was, like, new technology or oh, a new bro. restaurant. Or, like, what was the thing? Like, what food did when you I walked, eat? When I walked, I couldn't even eat the first two days, bro. Like, I, my stomach was in knots. And, like, yeah. we had catered, not catered stuff. But, like, my mom just, like, it looked like it was catered. And I, I just was just picking Like a stuff, celebration. Just, like, my stomach hurt. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I had family flying from all over the country and stuff. And, uh, but I couldn't even be around them. Like, so I had friends that would keep driving over. And I'm, like, a little kid. I wanted to go for rides in a car. Like, no joke. Someone would come over and I'd be like, take me to the gas station. Take me here. And I'd just, like, ride in the car with the windows down. Like, literally oh. almost put my head out of the thing like I was a dog. Like your dog. Like I was a dog, you know? <laughs> but you got to admit, I'm a solid confinement. You don't get fresh air for 11 months straight. Like, yeah. it's it's not 23-hour day lockdown. It's 24-hour day lockdown. I didn't leave that cell for 11 months, bro. Like, when you shower, they shackle you up and then leave you in the shower for an hour. So I wouldn't even, I would refuse my showers. I would just bird bath over the toilet every day. I do my prison routine, solitary confinement, wherever I'm at. Wow. So the hardest thing, sorry, I got sidetracked. No, you're good. The craziest thing, so I went away with the Nokia phones with Snake. No flat screen TV. No Bluetooth wasn't even out. I remember first hearing about Bluetooth, and I was like, no way, you know? And I remember hearing about the about the old Razor phones, like, when I was on my second yard, and I was like, damn, I want one of those phones, you know? And I walk in my brother's house, and I swear, bro, he had this 60-inch TV right in front of his pool table, and I, like, fainted. Like, <laughs> and I, like, started just bawling, and I was like, oh, my God, the TVs are this big out here, and I, like, just everything. You look around, you're like a kid, bro. Like, you can't believe that this is the world. That, and then I'm like, I can't believe I get to live here now. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's... I went and let me go in my room, and I was, like, clothes on the bed, and I'm like, you are kid. I just cried all day, bro. Like, literally yeah, you're cried born for again. days. Cried for days. So, you're, you're born again. Um, now, transitionary period is happening. Um, like, what do you first do? I imagine you don't just immediately go, I'm going to go talk about prison reform and different things. No, I almost what? kill myself first. Really? Yeah. So, so, walk me through that. So, I get out, and I'm like... The toughest thing, and, I've, and I'd always heard about this, too, is a lot of the shot callers in prison, they always go back to prison because they're the man in there. You know what I'm saying? It's tough out here. Like, and I always share this. Like, once you get out of prison, like, after, like, the honeymoon phase is over, like, we golf the whole first week. But then, like, my dad flies back. You know, everybody flies back. And now I'm like, oh, crap. What am I going to do? You know what I'm saying? And I have zero family that has, like, businesses I could work for. Like, nothing like that whatsoever. My brother works for himself, like, sells stuff online. Like, I, I'm like, I don't even know what the hell I'm going to do, you know? But I've never been to a bar. I've never been on a date. You know, and I'm 30 years old. And I've, after that thing happened to me, like, I didn't hook up with chicks really too much. Like, no joke, I was scared to touch women after that. So, like, I got out of 30 years old. I probably had sex less than 10 times in my entire life. No joke. So I lived at Sandbar, bro. No joke. Like, and I just partied every day and would just hook up with a bunch of chicks and did nothing productive. And... I got an assault case from there from some little 130-pound dude trying to talk shit to me when I was drunk. I didn't even hit him. I literally just poured his beer on him, and I was like, dude, get out of my face, bro. And, of course, he calls the cops, and if you throw a piece of paper at somebody, it's assault if they don't want the piece of paper thrown at them. So I almost got my parole violated. They put me on maximum security parole. That's not enough for me because I had this thing, like, I'm entitled to drink. I missed out on that part of my life. But I know in the back of my head I'm an addict. You know what I'm saying? So I know it's not good, but I just, I'm like, I can't go my whole life and never experienced that. that that was what I was telling myself you know like I, but it's a cop out reason to, to go do whatever my thing with alcohol is and I'm not like a closet drinker like a lot of alcoholics and stuff they drink by themselves and drink all day like I've never done that in my life I like to party that's it my thing when I drink alcohol is I don't have an off button and I'll say yes to drugs I'll like once I get hammered and I'm getting probably blacked out every time like 
I'll say yes to whatever, you know. And that's when the assault came. I don't even remember that stuff. And last thing I remember, I was doing a shot of rumplements in the afternoon at a buddy's birthday party, and we were at Hobnob. And I don't remember anything after that. And the next thing I know, I wake up in an ambulance. Mm. I ended up leaving the bar somehow and going and getting high with some dude that DM'd me on Facebook Messenger from prison. And I overdosed and literally died, bro. And it was one of my youngsters in prison. And he, he literally took the cash out of my wallet and left me to die. God saved my life, bro. Like, I didn't even believe in God at this point. And my ex-girlfriend's sister found me. No heartbeat, no anything. Blue, just drenched in sweat. She said I was hunched over in the bathtub, bathtub upside down. And she couldn't even lift me up because I was 260 pounds. Yeah. She couldn't even move me until I was there. And she said I was just soaking wet. And... um what happened is I probably did a shot of dope and just fell right back. And he saw me go out and just took my wallet and dipped. Wow. And, uh, but that's the type of people that I was in there with. They're 95% of them were all pieces of trash. Like literally. Yeah. And that was the hardest thing about being in prison. I was like, God, I can't wait to not be around people like this. That was what I told myself, you know, which is why I'm very s seclusive on who I've spent time with now. You know what I mean? And, um, I didn't find this out till afterwards, but she went to go tanning and she got, she parked her car. She got out of her car. She even walked up to the tanning bed salon. She said she put her hand on the door handle and something told her to go home. So she took her hand off the door handle and went home to take a nap. And she's the one that found me. Oh, my God. If she walks in there and then comes back, I'm dead. Like, you don't have too many seconds with the no heartbeat. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <coughs> Which is how I know God saved. And so the whole time I've had this in the back of my head, like, why did I get 12 years in prison and go through all that rough shit? And then, like, and then I was like, why, why was I just not in another OD case? You know what I'm saying? Like, I've had so many friends that got out of prison just, oh, they're OD, one, they do, they relapse and they're dead. You know what I'm saying? Like, we're used to doing a lot of drugs. So, like, you do a little bit and you're gone. That's what clearly what happened to me. And I was like, why the fuck would he save my life for that, you know? And I started making, I'll fast forward, I started making 20, 30, 40 grand a month. And I'm like, what the, f like, it, it just all clicked, you know? And I was like, yeah. fuck, God is real and I need to quit my job. And this is why I suffered and this is why I became so successful. So I can go and show these guys what the fuck we can do if we switch that. Yeah in our mind you know amazing what what was the time frame between getting out to that moment with the relapse i overdosed i was uh damn bro it wasn't even six months out wow july because my brother my sobriety date is my brother's birthday too is july 29th so for the rest of his life he would have been celebrating his birthday and my funeral <laughs> would have ruined the rest of his life you know what I yeah mean? for sure so come to find out which is so crazy here is when i'm in the hospital and when i'm in the ambulance I asked the guy, I was like, what the fuck happened? I thought I got in a bar fight or something for sure, you know? But I'm like, I'm not messed up, but I, like, was still incoherent. And he's like, you overdosed. And I remember telling him, I was like, I don't even use drugs anymore. And he's like, yeah. well, you did today. And I was like, how? How? Literally, how did this happen? And all I was, I was drinking at a bar with, like, people that don't even do drugs, you know what I mean? And But that's what my mind turns to, you know? When I get blacked out, I, like, resort to whatever, you know? And that's what my mind knows. And, uh... I get to the hospital. I'm, like, still, like, in and out of consciousness. And next thing I know, I hear my brother in the hallway. And, of course, me, I want to hide this from my family, right? I'm, like, I'm going to fix this, get out of the hospital, and not tell a soul what happened, you know? And I hear my brother in the hallway talking to my dad in South Dakota, who's, like, Mr. AA, like, 20-plus years sober, um, self-made millionaire, didn't get his life to until he was 45 years old, was bankrupt. Like, we, like when, you, when you learn how to switch that thing in your head, you can, we're all unstoppable, you know? And, uh... I remember yelling at my brother, I was like, why would you tell dad? And he's like, do you know how serious this was? I was like, I don't know anything, Matt. I literally don't know what the hell happened. They said I overdosed. And he's like, yeah, you were dead when they found you. And I'm like, what do you mean I was dead? And he's like, you had no fucking heartbeat. And he's like, then the doctor comes in. And he's like, congratulations. He goes, I've never seen someone survive in the condition that you came in. And I was like, what do you mean? And he goes, your heart was beating six beats a minute by the time they got me in there. They gave me like seven shots of Narcan and could still only get me to six, six beats a minute. <laughs> Fathom that. Yeah. But somehow I live. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's, it's just crazy. And I'm like, holy shit. I'm like, all right, whatever, fuck it. I guess dad's coming out and I fucked up again, you know? And I remember sitting back there thinking, like, something just came over and I was like, I'm not going to fucking let this, like, disease beat me, you know? Like, I haven't even had a chance of a life yet, you know? And I'm like, all right, maybe I need to try and quit drinking and just get sober and say, fuck the party, you know? And I did it. Like, I literally went out to my dad and stayed with him for a couple of weeks and, like, tried to make a game plan what I was going to do. Got my first 30-day sober chip out there f with my dad and then went out here and 
got uh, my boy Chad to get me hired at selling cars. Mm -hmm. And, like, literally the rest is history, bro. I made 10 months, my second month ever working in my life. Made 100 grand, 109 grand my first year working, 200 grand my second year, and then was making over 300 and quit working in five years. So you sold cars for five years? I was in finance. I made it in finance in 13 months. So I had my own office at a car dealership in Scottsdale. Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, I don't know where he went. Gilbert that's been sitting right here, he was in finance before he found solar. He looked familiar, too. So I think I've seen him somewhere before. Yeah, you can chat with him. Yeah, he did. The, he was in the finance department. I think he's. But like, and that's, so that's what I preach is once you s switch that thing in your head, like, and I switched to like from an alcoholic and drug addict mindset to like knowing that like my. I've been through so much shit, like nothing can phase me. Yeah. And I'm a hustler and I know how much I can do with my mind if I like literally put in the work to do it. Cause now I know all that stuff. So it like the prison, it, like it didn't teach me anything good except army with so many tools out here. If I knew, if I realized how to like turn them into something positive, you know? Yeah. And I made, yeah. So I, I, I was in sales for five months, bro. And then became assistant sales manager then made sales manager and then was in finance literally in 13 months and good literally bought an $84,000 Raptor off the showroom floor when I was still on parole, bro. I'm out of prison, not even two years. Congratulations. Yeah. Wow. And here's so, the deal. And I don't, I can, not to brag, but I can talk about money. Like I had a 0.001% chance of getting the money I got. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I walked away from the money to show people how to make money. You know what I'm saying? Like, and if you think I'm bragging about money, you're fucking clueless on life and you're not missing, you're missing every single thing about my message anyways. You know, and that's why I always tell people. Yeah. Well, we, First of all, this podcast is generally about money. So cool, cool. Talk about Perfect. all we all, we yeah all the time. Um, but what I want to say is, it seems to me, well, it's it's not even seems. You know this. You have an addictive personality. Hundred percent. So whenever you go in on something, good or bad, you go all in on it. And right, I think, and it's energy drinks and money right now. Like yeah, you know. What I'm saying? And I and I would I would um, even say that I feel like I have an addictive personality. I just have fortunately never been addicted to the wrong things for sure uh, and i think that anybody that has a high level of success has an addictive personality 100%. and they're that close to being addicted to the wrong things uh and, they're and all you, a little crazy yeah and they're all a little crazy and they're they're willing to do literally whatever it takes literally whatever it takes 100%. um so five years selling cars then you said you quit your job and that presumably is where now we start to become you today yeah. Um, so what did you start to do? You have a podcast, beautiful office. So like what's funny is, and I didn't even know I was going to do a podcast. Okay. I just say, I just saved up a bunch of money and I bought, you know, it was in real estate a little bit. So I had a, a big crib that I was going to sell if I needed to, if it, you know, and I was just like, I saw enough dudes. I didn't believe in social media. Like I thought Instagram was so lame, bro. Like I thought all that stuff was so lame and I didn't have time for that stuff. Mm -hmm. Like when I quit my job, I think I had 500 followers or something like that. You know, and it was just like, I would just post golf pictures or something like nothing big. And and I saw enough dudes making money on Instagram and stuff. And I was just like, I've, I'm going to figure something out. You know, like there's no chance I'll not figure something out out here. I got, I got tired of taking orders from people. And to be honest, I didn't like my boss. And my other boss flipped out on me one time about me parking in like the place I park every day. He was just having a bad day. Keep in mind, I'm not used to people talking to me like that. You know what I'm saying? Like still, like... I didn't get talked to like that in prison. Like, I didn't, that's the one thing, like, when I was a youngster up and coming, like, I didn't fuck up at all. Like, they told me something, I did it. Like, I've never been, like, scolded by a dude in prison. Like, never. So, like, now I'm, like, a finance manager of this car dealership in Scottsdale, and my little five foot ten, six year old boss just reams me in front of everybody. Like, talks so bad to me, which I'm, like, I couldn't even respond to him. And he's, like, you hear me? And I'm just, like, and I literally just looked away from him. And yeah. I'm, like, and everybody's, like, looking at me, like, holy shit. What? And I'm, like. And I told him, I was like, I'm fucking out on this place. Like, that was what I needed. You know what I'm saying? Like, I've been trying to plot a way out of here. I was like, that is what it is. I'm like, no one's going to talk to me like that. I will not work for someone that's just going to fucking berate me like that. Because I can't fucking pull my hands on him like I want to, you know? And I can't yell back at him, you know? And um, I was going to finish the month out. And I called my GM in my office. And, like, the only guy that ever took a chance on me, you know what I'm saying? Nobody wanted to take a chance on me. I'm, you know, 6'4", covered in tattoos, neck tattoo, you know? Zero work history. Never had a job in my life. He's all about, like, dude, he's just the greatest human being, you know, and he just, like, literally said he wanted to give me a chance. And uh, so I call him in there, and I'm, like, we both cried for, like, literally an hour, bro. And I was just, like, I don't know what to say other than I'm quitting my job. He's, like, what do you mean? I was, like, I'm just out, man. I'm, like, I want to go help people and do more than this. Like, I just, I don't know what to say other than I know this isn't right. Like, I'm not meant to sit in this office. Like, and uh, he's, like, well, do you have a plan? I was, like. No, but I have a lot of money saved up, and I know, like, I'm just betting on myself, Josh. That's it. I'm like, I want to leave on good terms, so, like, if I screw this up, like, trust me, I'm going to come back and ask for my job back. But, like, 
I got to try this. Like, if I don't ever try this, I'll regret this for the rest of my life, you know? Yeah. And he's like, I support you in anything. He's like, if it doesn't work out, he's like, you can. I was like, and I know his rules. Like, you got to work your way back up. I was like, if I have to come back and sell cars, whatever, I'll make 10, 12 grand a month selling cars and work my way right back to finance. He's like, if this doesn't work out, he goes, you got your own office back even. He goes, I'm a huge fan of yours. And he goes, I'm, I'll support any one of my guys. It was just one of the greatest conversations, you know? And uh, so I left. And what I did is I'm, a, I'm like a networking. That's what I preach is networking, bro. So, like, I honestly think I'm the most connected dude in Arizona, like literally, and it's all from my own connections. I talk to people everywhere I'm at. Like I pass out flyers at the gym. Like I'm just a self-made self-promoter. I've never spent a dollar on ads. I've never paid a thing for Instagram, never done anything for my podcast, all word of mouth and just hustling and networking and talking to people, bro. Yeah. And uh, I've built up this like crazy network. And on top of that, I was in finance. So, like, everybody I did, I saw their income. I saw where they lived. And then I saw who I possibly wanted to be connected to. So, like, I built up a phone book just from finance there. You know what I'm saying? And Right. Um, so, what I did then is I quit my job. I was going to take, like, a little mini, like, no joke, vacation retirement. Like, I had never traveled before because I just started making money. So, I worked every weekend, though. So, I go to, like, I go travel. I go to my, uh, my dad's buddy's lake house and just chill for a month and golf. And then I start just meeting with everybody I knew. And I was just, like coffee gym whatever it was I was just working out with a different dude every day and I was just like trying to pick their brain and see where I can make something happen yeah. and to this day it was a god thing but my buddy Justin Bowie who is the first podcast companies that I had signed with his wife posted and he's a really successful plumber he owns J Max plumbing I don't know if you know him um but he's like like a huge huge plumbing company and then his wife posted like a podcast studio and in this time, I've been interviewed by Vice TV now when I was in a car, car dealership. So I had this Vice TV show coming out. And that's I banked on that a little bit, too. I was like, I got the Vice TV show, show coming out. So I'll probably get a lot of traction from that. And I'm just going to try and build a name and a brand and just see what the hell I can do, you know? And um, I was like, what is that studio? She goes, Justin's a partner in a podcast studio. She goes, you should hit him up. And I'm like, what the hell? I'm like, that'd be a good idea. And I was like, yeah. Because I'd been interviewed on a few different ones. And, I, and the comments were always saying, like, this dude needs his own show. So I was like, it was like, that was like an idea I had in the back of my head, you know? And to this day, she's never posted anything from the podcast. That was the only time she ever posted at this podcast studio, too, which is, like I said, it was a God thing because I was meant to see that. And I go meet with him, and I take – do you know who Big Herc from Fresh Out Series is? I don't. Okay, he has a big YouTube following. He's, like, one of the biggest prison YouTubers. He has, like, okay. 600,000 subscribers. And um, I brought him with me because I don't know shit about any of this stuff, and I don't want to, like, look sound stupid. At least I have a guy right. that's got a following with me, you know, because I'm like – all this stuff I'm learning on the fly, and that's what I said, like – there was no one to really get advice from on, 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 like, what to do. Like, no one's, like, done, like, my footsteps to the right. next transition. Like, so there wasn't really anyone to get, to get advice from, you know? I would try and pick people's brains on, like, just certain stuff. But, like, you know, I had to just figure it out on the fly, you know? So I go there. They talk about doing a podcast with us. We have a talk for, like, an hour, and it ends up, Herc doesn't say a word, and these fools just jam it for an hour straight. And it was a good talk. We leave the next day, and then... Justin calls me again. He's like, hey, can you meet us for dinner again? I was like, sure. So we go there, and he's like, here's the deal. We want to do a podcast, but he's like, we want to do it with only you. Um, we love your story, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, all right, cool, let's do it. I don't know anything about it, so, like, we brainstormed the whole thing together. They were pretty good at it, and then we launched, I launched a podcast through them, and we were just doing episodes every other week to see how it went. And by this time, I just made a ton of more connections, and uh, the podcast just kind of started taking off, and – I want to grow, and they couldn't even grow as fast as I want to grow because I'm like, all right, I need to start doing episodes every week now, and they're like, well, we, we don't do that. You know, they produce, like, a bunch of different podcast shows. Right. But I'm like, well, I told them from the jump, like, if it takes off, I want to start, like, doing more and more and more, and I told them from the jump. So we just ended up splitting, and I went and signed with Dave Pratt's uh, studio at Star Worldwide Networks, and um, I just love it, man. Like, I, I feel like my podcast has the most wide range of guests that anybody, any platform has. Because I don't just put dudes on there because you're fucking, you know, a successful multi-million dollar entrepreneur. You know what I'm saying? That's, that shit can get boring and played out. Like, everybody has that. You know what I'm saying? I have those guys on my show, but then I have, like, the dude that ran the prison cartel right after that. You know what I'm saying? And then, like, yeah. Sheriff Lamb right after that. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, everybody has different inspiring stories, but that's all I want is, like, someone to have, like, an inspiring story or something that they can teach people a ton of stuff. Like, Fleischman, like, he had no trouble, but, like, listeners episode you can learn so much from him you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. so one of the things i picked up out of that is is you're one of your it seems like one of your biggest keys of success is n is your network yeah which obviously the cliche term network is your net worth and that's so true because i'm not joking like i'm not smart at all bro like i don't know shit out here but like i have a ton of smart friends now so like right. what i do like when i when i find someone that i think is a good connection or some way that we can make money i like have a shout out to like 
James Christensen, Keith Richardson, and Chris Bisney, who's my lawyer. And those are the guys that I call for anything, like no joke. And like, if I like meet a guy that's big and I think we can do something, I literally run it by them. And they're like, oh no, that's stupid. Cause like, at first you gotta know, like I wasn't hip to all the fraud stuff, you know what I'm saying? So I was like, oh, this thing is legit, you know? And they're like, bro, Dude. hell no. <laughs> so that was the one thing he told me, he goes, before you do anything, just make sure you run it by me. So like, luck I have some good friends and that's what I preach is like about your network. So like I can run anything by them. They'll give me advice for free on anything. And it's been like, so, so helpful to me. I'm meeting with my lawyer after this to do like some different like contracts that I get because now people send me contracts and I have him look over everything because I'm still not yeah. smart, but I'm a hustler. Yeah. So what I say is get yourself in the room and just have guys that are smart to figure the other stuff. But I like, yeah. but I'm the best at getting myself in the room. Yeah. I, I, and I would actually piggyback off that. I don't care who you are. You probably should have other people look at it. Yeah, uh, for sure. So I wouldn't downplay yourself there. Um, so let's talk about money now. Like what are you doing to monetize your so brand? The, so the podcast, I'm still funding that all by myself. I'm just now starting to talk to a few sponsors, but I'm only going to let a few companies sponsor my podcast. You know, like Transcend First Forum. I've been talking with Mike Spankenberg at State 48. Um, oh, great. Yeah, so, because I'm very selective. I don't want it to come off, like, cliche and have a bunch of ads and stuff like that. So, like, I'm only going to work with a sponsor that can let me, like, and let me work and promote their stuff organically like I want to as it is, you know? So, um, I do, big thing I do is credit card processing. I, like, oh, okay. I literally middleman deals. Is that your main source of income? Right now, for sure. And, like, overnight it was. Wow. I have an app coming out though next month, which is like a sober app that's going to have like life coaching and stuff in the app store. You can download it for free and then pay for upgrade stuff. Um, I have my own prison curriculum that I made, which this will be the biggest thing. Um, because my podcast is on every tablet in every prison across the country, which will be 1.5 million tablets by the end of the year. Wow. Yeah. And then I developed my own prison curriculum, which is like stuff I taught because now they have iPads in there. So now they can watch videos of me talking, teaching them how to start switching that mindset in there. So, like, because I can't imagine how much farther ahead I'd be if I, like, had a mindset and switched before I even got out, you know? So I do that, and then I'll sell that to the state and government and uh, all their facilities for, like, reentry budgets. Yeah. And then when they do the prison curriculum, then they can get out, and I'm trying to work a deal to where the state will then pay for them to get my upgraded out for free, too. They get it for free when they get out for a year. Because I want the state to want them to be in constant contact with me, you know what I'm saying? Yep. So that's my goal is I'm trying to work is for them to pay for that for them for the first year when they get out as well. And when you say curriculum, you're not talking just a podcast. You're talking like a course. Yeah. This is your first day. This is going to happen. You won't be able to eat, like, type of All stuff. All that stuff. Well, like, we're going to, like, make it a, literally a game plan because, like, I didn't have a plan. And, like, you got to, like, like, budgeting. Like, I have credit stuff in there. Like, all kind of different stuff. Right. It's so hard. And they know nothing. You're just plopped and you're like, okay, go win. And you're yeah. like, how do I go get a job right now? Literally. And there's a, and like I said, there's 0.001% of people are just yeah. like, you could throw me in a, a like fucking in Afghanistan and I'm going to figure shit out. Like, you know what I'm saying? Right. But most people aren't like that. Yeah. Cause I mean, even from a, just a hiring perspective, okay, here's a resume and there's a, there's a, there's a blank period yes. in terms of the dates we, you worked for we 12 years. We even tell them how to explain that in there too. You know what I'm saying? And like, always be upfront about it. Like, and the one thing I did notice too is, People love prison success stories. You know what I'm saying? And they love second chances. So, like, if you can just, like, here's the thing. Sales is life. Literally. If you, even if you're not in sales, it's, you're doing sales every day no matter what it is. Like, when I was on a, when I was on a forward and I'm trying to, like, get out to, like, go past it or something like that, like, I have to sell the cop on fucking what whack-ass reason I'm getting them to pop my cell door for. That's yeah. sales. You know what I'm saying? The quicker that you realize that and just sell yourself to anybody, it's, like, it's, it's, it's the circle of life out here. Yeah, everybody's selling themselves every day. 100%. The, so the you first just sell yourself to people. And that's handshake it. to the woman, yeah. to the Get job. Get in front of people and sell yourself to them. And the worst thing that can happen is they don't like you. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, yeah. So just kind of now getting into more, I guess, mindset pieces. Um, first of all, from a routine perspective, I'm actually curious what your day-to-day -day looks like nowadays. Um, like, So if you go online, right, there's, there's all these Instagram guys, YouTube, and they're always talking about, you know, I, 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 get up in the morning. I meditate and then I take my notes and I'm, maybe you're about to say you do that. And then I look silly. But uh, generally, when I really talk to guys, it's like, no, I don't do that. Like, what do you do? I'm just curious. <laughs> Not nothing like that at all. <laughs> it's uh, like, to, to be honest, the top of my to do list things are is to start making my bed. And like, literally, I want to start meditating and get off my phone for the morning. I'm, I'm going to try and do at least 30 minutes. I've been telling myself this for weeks, though, now, you know, but like Bradley, a lot of the big guys, they all do that, you know, like so. My goal is to literally get up and do, like, a five or ten minute meditation. I just think it's so, like, hard for me. Like, I, I have ADD so bad. Like, meditation is just not a thing. So, I'm, I'm, I want to get there someday, whatever it is, what it is. But, like, so me, I get up 5, 36 in the morning. Um, I now I'll try to just, like, do a post in the morning. And I, like, take the first hour to, like, eat, mess with the dog. And I go straight to the gym in the morning. Because I was, like, my, like, when you're in prison, it's the same thing, too. You get, like, morning rack and go get your workout done in the morning. 
Um, I get done with that. That's why I told him, like, pretty much after 10, 11, I'm free. And that's why I, like, literally still go, like, do meetings whether I'm meeting with, like, credit card processing deals or, like, just – and my life literally is just, like, meetings. Besides my podcast I release on Wednesday in the afternoon, it's pretty much just meetings and, like, filming some content stuff. Yeah. And, uh, dude, I have a fairy tale life now. Like, literally a fairy tale life. Like, I just met a new chick last week, and, like, she's been – we've been spending the last few days together, and she's, like – this is like seriously your life. And I was like, it's crazy. Right. And I'm like, she's like, I can't even believe like this is your life. And I'm like, I still can't believe I, I pull up to my house sometimes and I cry still to this day, bro. Like no joke. Like I can't like my neighbor's a FBI detective for 25 years. And I live in a private home, like custom home community. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and I have the biggest home in our community. And I'm like, you know, I have a 3,500 square foot, uh, five bedroom crib all by myself. And I'm like, it's, it's crazy, bro. But it just like shows what we can all do. You know, I'm like, I have an eighth grade education. Like I don't even, I don't even know math. And I was in finance. Yeah, you can literally do anything because I use a calculator, and I would screw up like finding book values out every time, and I would do it vice versa. I just knew if the number came out screwed up, it wasn't right, and I had to flip the numbers. <laughs> Seriously, but that was my job. You know what I mean? And yeah. like to banks, like when I'm calling banks and trying to get them, getting them to buy these loans for these car deals, it's like I'm literally selling them on that, and it's not even about like for the most part. I realize even then is like they don't even care about the numbers. Like they just want to be talked to nice, and like the fact that you have a plan for them or something, you know? Like, and so I would sell the story to them. Like the dude is. He just got hired at this new job. You know, his wife and him were fighting, but he's in this new relationship. And I would, like, sell these stories to these bank tellers. I get them to buy these loans that no one was getting them to buy. And I realized that, like, just talk to people, bro. You know what I'm saying? That's it. People just want to be yeah. talked to. Stories sell. Facts tell. Do. Stories 100%. sell. yeah. Yeah. So the, the credit card processing business is interesting to me because you're saying – when you're saying to me, meetings, 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 you're just basically acquiring clients and it's kind of like running on the back end. Is and that it's the best thing in the world because it's free money and you don't like nobody will ever switch. You're getting the percent when they swipe their card. You're getting a small. But even percent. better than that, I'm lowering what they're paying already. So nobody that's ever going to go with the, like, let me get their credit card processing will pay more than me. The yep. only way I'm getting their account is if I'm saving them thousands. Yeah. No joke. I just got a direct line with a dude that has really, really good rates with the bank. And it turned in, he proposed the idea to me because I have so many contacts. And what I did is I ran this by my three smartest friends and they ended up using it and saving them, save one of them, the biggest ones, like 300 G's a month, bro. Wow. But he's, a, you know, he's a, he did the, he did his company does 70 mil a month. Is it payroll too or no? What do you mean? Uh, is it just credit card processing invo or can that it be also... You know, sending out payroll, invoicing. They do all like that, that, and they do even pin debit. So, like, that's one of the biggest ones is pin debit in um, marijuana industry. Wow, which is that I don't know too much about that. That's really generally a cash only business still. Mm -hmm. That's why you can only do pin debit. They can't do credit until it's federally right. legal. Which they say uh, this guess, fall or spring it'll happen. I guess it knows. could happen. Yeah, yeah. And that's what I do. So then I re I hire not hire, but like I recruit a bunch of like. I call them like my youngsters out here, like prison youngsters that want to go make extra side money and then go get them businesses. All I do is have them go get me credit card statements and send it. I give them my guys. Literally, that's all I need is one statement. They send them Got back it. a full out-the-door comparison, breakdown side-by-side side like you're buying a car. It shows them how many thousands they're saving with them. If they switch monthly and then a five-year savings. If they like it, they switch. It costs them $0, and I get paid every month. It's, it's funny. It has a lot of synergy to solar. Yeah. You're sitting down. You're saying, hey, you're paying 200 we can get you to 150, no money out of pocket, sign here. The difference Except for is there's no, no loan. Exactly, because, yeah, I'm not, I'm, yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't do solar for that myself. Yeah. Um, so, so the mindset, just swinging back through, I just wanted to learn about that a little bit. Um, like, from a mindset perspective, first of all, I agree with you on the phone thing. That's one thing that I um, have been trying to accomplish. Yeah. It's like, just for small spurts of time, it's almost impossible like today, I had a, uh, a meeting got scheduled at 5 a.m. this morning. I didn't need to have my camera on, but it was on Zoom. So I'm like, I'm setting my alarm at 5 a.m. So then you're literally alarm, Zoom, you're on a meeting. And from there, I mean, there was never another moment yeah. where I, I haven't been on my phone. Um, Anthony, we had a, another gentleman on our podcast recently, and he he said he has a he doesn't do meditation because it's hard for him. And I find that a lot of people are ADHD in this world because all of our attention spans are screwed. So bad, yeah. And he said, I have a period of pause. And he's like, all I do is go out to the balcony. He has a dog as well. Just no phone for 10 minutes, and I just let my mind wander however it wants. I don't have to have a structure. I could do something like that, yeah. And I, that resonated with me so much because when I hear meditation, I almost get scared because I'm like, for sure. do I have to like cross my legs yeah. and do this, yeah. you know? Um, dude, I did one with a guy and he was like, asked me, he's like, 
and he was like asking me questions what he's doing and i'm like i'm like oh, I'm, I'm like dude my, my head was racing i like wasn't even thinking about what he was talking about too and i'm like i told you he's like sorry yeah <laughs> but yeah i've tried it it's hard you have to slow your brain down and i'm sure as we're even talking your brain's in a it, it, there's a, a thousand lane highway <laughs> Dude, my, and it's oh, never stops. On my podcast, it happens all the time. Like, if, if my guest is talking, and it's so funny, like, but and it just shows, like, I'm like, you just figure shit out as you go. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I, like, so to this day, what I do is if, like, say you're on my show and you're making a point or something like that, but then I think of another thing I want to ask you, I already know how sidetracked I get. I'm going to forget what it is by the time you finish talking. So what I'll do is I'll literally. <laughs> this has happened five times in this podcast yeah. to me. So what I'll do is I'll literally do, like, prison gang sign language. Like, if it's, like. I'll say, like, oh, I wanted to ask Lindsay about, like, her gang life or something like that. So I'll literally, like, put a G like this, and I'll hold the G under the desk until she gets done talking. I'm like, oh, G, gang life. I'm like, oh, so what were you saying about the gang life? I literally do that to this day. <laughs> yeah, because there were several times where you were talking, but I didn't want to. And then there's, like, a point, and then I'm like, oh, I lost it. Yeah. And I'll go, you ask me a point, and I'll start rambling, and then I won't even make the point. And I'm like, oh, shit, I forgot <laughs> about the point you asked. So... I want to actually talk about that. But that's what I like in life. Like, nothing's perfect. Like, we just figure stuff out. No. That's, like, literally what I preach. So it's, that's There's why no it's name so to this awesome podcast, and, by the way. That's this what is... I like. It's authentic and genuine, you know? Yeah. Just figure shit out, you know? Yeah, which I think has... Um, so we started this company nine months ago. Wow, okay, cool. Um, and we went zero to... By the end of this month, we'll do zero to 60 million this year in the first nine months. And none of us... What is your process, man? ...have owned... A, well, that's why I was asking some questions. All right, we'll so we'll, we'll figure that out later. Um, zero to 60 million, but none of us have owned a company. We just all came from sales there and solar. Yep. Um, the reason I bring that up is every single day, it's just figuring it out, falling forward, failing, figuring it out. Yeah. That didn't work. That pissed off that rep. Oh, don't do that. I think this happens. I'm like, I'll ask this guy, like, hey, what do you think about this? Yeah, you just figured it out. Yeah, we talked to the reps. Hey, what do you think about this? Um, which I think has just so much value when you're saying that is that there's so many people waiting for the right time. They're waiting for the right moment. They need the perfect makeup or they need the perfect Literally. camera. Just go out and start doing your idea. 100%, yeah. Um, so before we, we wrap it up, I, I, I want to kind of touch on your future. Like what's the end goal for you if you have one? Um, and and kind of what does that path look like? To be honest, I, th I, th I think I'm going to be like the face of like changing – people's lives when they get out of prison for like the whole country like i think like i no joke i think i'm gonna single-handedly change the recidivism rate in the in the entire country because with the podcast and the tablets now like feds are nationwide so it's not only like an arizona thing but like i'll be across the whole country i know i know how people in prison think they know you know i mean i there's not a dude in prison that can say he didn't do this you know what i'm saying i've, I've done the max the super max i've to put work beyond work in prison so like it, I honestly think it's the perfect storm, and that's why I was suffering, went through all that stuff in there because it's what's gonna like make the biggest impact for people in there. And I and I plan on having like my own housing for them, cars. Like I'm gonna have an entire movement for dudes when they get out of prison and stuff out here. Wow! Like I want to, so, I'm gonna be the bank, like for even with cars with them, because they get out here. I did finance. Yeah, they're getting their mom saying. a co-sign or something like that, or if not, they have a 29 percent interest rate. You yeah. know what I'm saying? They have a six hundred dollar car payment, and then and then car. people wonder why they can't get out of the rut and they end up back in prison. They literally and they're making fifteen dollars a month. Like what the and uh, gas? Hashtag <laughs> Joe Biden. Like you know, I didn't want to. I don't ever like to talk politics, but yeah, like you know what I mean? It's like, and that's where the budgeting comes in. You think I need, I got to get a car and a job, or whatever? And you don't even realize that your car and your gas is costing thousand dollars a month right there. That's as much as your rent. You make <laughs> two grand a month. You're screwed. So what do they do? Yeah. They go back to selling drugs. You know what I'm saying? So we got a budget for them, and then like I have like uh, different. Um, companies that are like going to give them like CDLs. And so they're going to like give trades and stuff before they even get out and like direct employment through my app when they get out. And then I get paid from government for employment. My gosh, them. this is awesome. It's going to be not first No, I'm not joking. This is no, never been done because it's never been possible because they didn't have iPads. Now they have iPads. It changes the game. Well, and by the time they're out, they've already been on the program. They already feel like they know you and they're then, with it. And, and they're, they're with, with it. it. They're yeah, that's incredible. And, and in terms of just kind of, Another, sorry, another greatest thing, too, no, is, like, I, I want to, like, get them to walk away from the gangs when they're in prison, even, too. Because, like, you know, I almost caught a sentences, like, getting out right before I got out, you know? And it's, like, that's not cool. But it's, it, they'll only listen to a guy like me telling them it's not cool. You yeah, they won't saying? listen to me. No, they won't. They won't so, listen like, to the parole officer. And that's my biggest thing. It's, like, the brother, Aaron brother dudes were snitching on me until I got out. Like, literally, like, everybody snitches in there, like, and they just, like, it's the dirtiest place in the world, bro. Like, it's, it's, and kids risk their lives for these dudes you know what i'm saying so that's the biggest thing is i want to get in their ears and tell them like 
fuck those dudes. What's cool is changing your life. You know what I'm saying? Be so selfish that you actually put Literally. yourself first for those once. Those motherfuckers don't care about you. They don't give a shit about you. And I'll tell them, like, trust me, the fools got would just eat me up. And I would put in, dude, mission after mission and end up in solitary confinement and barely sending me some tobacco in there. And then I go back to Max and fucking same thing over again, you know? And then yeah. they're snitching on me. And it's just like, dude. Yeah. Yeah. You can tell I'm so, so frustrated with it. Yeah. But, but the change that you're making is just phenomenal already and this program is just i mean and i've only been out of work for a year but like i just started all this stuff yeah that's what i'm getting at is just this is all new which is why it's i mean you have ideas i mean you're just constantly working on this yeah um yeah that we i've had this conversation tv bro like i don't even watch tv yeah you well I, i agree i don't either i can't uh one of the actually things about stress trying to manage stress in life i believe it's directly correlated with watching the news in particular for sure i mean when's the last time you hopped on to a news show that they were talking about something super positive i mean negativity yeah. sells mm-hmm. um if if you know that i think you can angle things better 100 percent. um yeah the, the last part of that that i wanted to touch on about the economy because it's a financial related podcast is like how do people survive in 2022 like the average joe I was just having a conversation with Jason and some others. It was like, I don't know where we went. I think it was maybe Panera Bread or something. It was like 67 bucks. And we got, yeah, we got like a sandwich and a flatbread. And a, it was like, how do people survive yeah, um, bro. on a, on a call it even a three, four, five thousand dollar a month income? How do people survive right now? I mean, like literally everybody's just got to get side hustles. Yeah. That's what I think, to be honest, like, Either that or, like, get a, get a different job or you got to get side hustles, you know? Like, stop partying on the weekends and make a few hundred extra bucks on the weekend, you know? Like, literally, like, one thing that fascinates me out here, <coughs> excuse me, and when I, before I had my little moment of clarity, I remember sitting in Samra and I told my little brother, we were drinking one day, it was like a Sunday afternoon, and I was like, you guys, this is all you guys do on the weekends? Like, you know, I was like, it was fun, but I'm like, it was like kind of enough for me already, you know what I mean? I'm like... It just it was just a lot. Like every weekend, you just drink all weekend. You know, it's, it's tiring. Like, it's yeah, it's exhausting, and it's like it takes a lot to recover. And then I was like, do you know how much farther that people would be if they would even just like take one of their weekends off, like put eight hours into doing something productive or trying to make a side hustle? Yeah. Even if you want to like still be lame and like not like strong, like we'll give you Friday and Saturday. Like just do Sunday. You know what I'm saying? You can still drink and party and do whatever you want Friday and Saturday night. Just Sunday, like do productive stuff. Try and like figure out another way to make uh, make money. Try and learn something new. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I just, like, get in the rooms and try and figure stuff out, and then stuff turns into income. Like, you know what I'm saying? Or, like, I didn't know anything. You just, like, got to go try stuff and get out of fucking bars and hanging out and just watching TV. Like, TV and bar, yeah. like, it's just all, like, people waste so much time out here, but they have no appreciation for, like, losing their whole freedom. You know what I'm saying? So they have no, they don't have a concept of, like, that they're gifted with this time out here. It's just given to them. So they have no appreciation for it. You are the type of guy that can literally say, I don't give a shit what you're going through. You can go out on the other side. Leave them with something. I want you to just leave them with a message of, of whatever you're going through. Yeah, because that's another thing, too, is you don't realize, like, I deal with a lot of help, like, really successful, successful people, and they're, like, the most, some of the most broken. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'll, I'll always say this. Like, anybody struggling or something like that, like, Money doesn't make you happy. Money makes life easier, you know what I'm saying? And I feel like, and I'm in agreement, it's impossible to be happy without money. But money doesn't make you happy. I've met dudes that are tr- trillionaires that are, like, absolutely miserable. Like, there is a way out. I promise you that. Like, and there is an answer. You just have to, like, start making the changes. Like, I'm, a, I'm just exactly what you said earlier, man. It's like, stop putting it off. Like, literally, if you're unhappy, make a fucking change tomorrow. Like, literally, that's, that's as simple as that. Like, if you're unhappy in your life and you're miserable or you're depressed or something like that, for one, fucking DM me. Two... Tomorrow, do something fucking different. Because if you're unhappy and you do the same thing every day, like that's the definition of insanity. You're going to be unhappy every fucking day. Do something different. Yeah. That's it. Well, Chappie, we, we, didn't, we, we, we got we to gotta hear it before we go. Uh-huh. How did the addiction get started? Literally, the, it's just some chapstick addiction. You, you didn't have the addiction prior? You just started no, enjoying so what, using was, it? No. Uh, before, like, you know, I think start? they have shitty chapsticks, and I read on it like that there's stuff in there that like the more you use it, the more you're addicted I'm to it. I'm convinced of that, so I don't use it. Yeah, so I'm like, and I'm at just at right here. I'm at the point of no return. Like, I just need chapstick all day long. And it's also a good thing for when you're fighting in prison. If you put a little chapstick in your hand, your fucking hand's a rock. Uh, so if I'm, if I'm going to like get into some, I for sure I'm a chapstick in my hand. Yeah. Okay. I get it. Well, man, this has been fun. Thank Thanks you for, for sure. coming. Absolutely. 
And um, yeah, we're, we'll put all of your stuff in the description so they cool. can find you. And again, thanks for coming. Appreciate Absolutely. it. Thanks Jason, for appreciate cool. you for putting it together. Absolutely. No, it was a good interview. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I'll have to grab Gilbert wherever he's at. He said he might have recognized him. Yeah.